Okay. Yeah, yeah. Josh Spinney, licensed professional counselor. I'm a counselor supervisor at Cedar Mountain Center, and uh, I'm here today along with two of my colleagues to speak to you all about recognizing uh, your holiday blues and how to uh, correct the holiday blues to make them more holiday joys. Um, today uh, we're going to hear from myself, Amber Shire, and uh, Kira Rafino, who all work here at Cedar Mountain Center and Behavioral Health for Cody Regional Health. As you see here, we have a nice little slideshow that uh, we're going to go through and kind of help us help you see a little bit about how our uh, our decision making and um, our effective thinking, our habits, and stress management can also uh, work together in a very good harmony to help us maintain uh, control over our lives throughout the chaotic holiday seasons. As we are coming up on tomorrow being New Year's Eve, uh, that being the end of 2020, yay, <laughs> I think everyone's looking forward to that. We're hopeful for a better 2021. Um, using some of these tasks and activities as well as uh, applying some of this information to your life can bring about a uh, tremendous new year. So I'll start with talking a little bit about some of the uh, some of the ways that we trip ourselves up with what we call cognitive distortions or thinking errors um, is a more appropriate term for them. Um, our emotions uh, affect our thinking and our thinking affects our emotions. An interpretation is an internal behavior that determines the meaning of an event, which uh, that meaning depends on our own unique perspectives um, based on our memories and experiences in life. Recognizing when we get stuck in our interpretations and getting ourselves unstuck from interpretations takes some work. In order to be open to becoming unstuck, we must open uh, to further evaluation and shifting and expanding interpretations, bringing awareness to the fact that no interpretation can be the absolute truth. And I know sometimes when we have a memory about something, we can say, oh, I know that color. I remember it was that color shirt or it was that type of an event. And someone says, hey, here's a photo of that event and it's not that color and we're dumbfounded. Guess what, our memory is not always perfect. Even though we might think it is, it's not always 100% perfect. So getting caught in our interpretations of events can sometimes lead us down paths to all or nothing thinking, which is uh, when we bring awareness to language in our interpretations, such as using the words always, never, every, and all the time. Nothing always happens, nothing never happens. Using the word sometimes gives you an opportunity to use correct terminology because sometimes things do happen and sometimes things don't go the right way uh, but sometimes things are amazing and sometimes things are exactly the way they should be uh, but things cannot always and things cannot never happen um, if they're occurring at a sometimes rate um, when you use that word as a replacement you'll be more open to alternative interpretations helping break that cycle where uh, getting caught in all or nothing thinking can sometimes be damaging to relationships and also damaging to um, your view of, of others, uh, view of situations, view of experiences, and leading to um, increased depressive feelings. Magnification and uh, minimization. Minimization occurs when something large or significant is looked at as something very small. Uh, mountains out of molehills is what we kind of look at here. And magnification is the exact opposite of minimization, uh, whereby exaggeration the importance of an, importance of an event leads to interpretation of an event and making it much larger than it really is. So when we make molehills into mountains and mountains into molehills, we're not actually seeing it as something as it's realistic as it is. Uh, if I'm diminishing the impact of something, I'm not gonna put as much effort into trying to resolve that. If something is so big that I can't overlook it, I'm gonna have a very difficult time getting around it, which can lead to increased depressive uh, experiences and um, uh, depressive symptoms based upon uh, eroding relationships, eroding friendships, uh, family issues. Um, and every family has, uh, has those things that everyone knows about but nobody talks about. And those things can sometimes come up when you look at magnification and minimization. Our next one here on the, our list towards effective thinking is recognizing catastrophizing. Uh, this is the cousin to magnification and minimization. 
It sees only the worst possible outcomes of an event or interpretation of an event. Uh, when we catastrophize, we make things as bad as humanly possible, um, which is not always the case. Things don't always go that way, and they don't never go that way, remember? So sometimes things do go horribly wrong. But if we can recognize that that doesn't always occur and it never occurs, then we give ourselves an opportunity to change our interpretation of that event. Um, jumping to conclusions, much like in the movie Office Space, um, when you jump to a conclusion, um, it's interpreting an event or the meaning of a situation with little to no evidence. Um, there are always uh, two ways we get caught in, uh, in this paradox, uh, mind reading and fortune telling. If you can mind read and you can fortune tell, then you're predicting something for someone else um, which you aren't in control of. So you have to look at yourself and look at how much you can control on, on a situation to recognize if you're jumping to conclusions based on information that you've interpreted or based on information you're interpreting for others. Um, I know that I can't read others' minds, although some people say, well, you stop reading my mind. I just read verbal cues. <laughs> Um, and nonverbal cues. Another one is magical thinking. Um, this is something that people come to therapists a lot and say, well, do you have a magic wand? And the answer is no. Uh, well, I, I don't have one personally. I do know some therapists that do have it, and it does hold some magical powers. Um, but I don't personally have one. So when magical thinking occurs, I like to remind people that I can't wave a wand and make things magically disappear. Uh, magical thinking often looks at uh, <coughs> when the belief that acts will influence unrelated situations. So I often say, like, saying I'm a good person, bad things shouldn't happen to me, is not really uh, a realistic expectation. It's a thinking error. Bad things happen to everybody. Good things happen to everybody. And recognizing that uh, gives me a little bit more balance. One of my favorites, confirmation bias. I see this a lot. Selective information gathering uh, leads to only gathering information that fits your current belief. When this occurs, we really kind of pigeonhole our, our opportunities to grow in our, our thoughts and our effective thinking becomes ineffective because the things we're looking at um, only fit the narrative that we're trying to have uh, put out there. Um, when I gather or when I ignore evidence to the contrary of my belief, I lead to rigidity of opinions. Um, and difficulty with changing a perspective. Unfortunately, when that occurs, um, you, you end up uh, really kind of putting yourself on one side or the other of the story and not allowing yourself to hear uh, really kind of what's, what's occurring. Um, this past year, we had a presidential election, um, and an election uh, was a very uh, charged election. And we've seen uh, more this year more than any that division that occurred um, based upon confirmation bias, depending on what source of information you were getting your information from, um, which led to a lot of conflict, as people probably remember watching the news and television, there was a tremendous amount of conflict in on social media, much like the platform we're using right now, um, with people having their opinions matched by confirmation bias. Led to a lot of breakdowns in a lot of relationships, which was really un unfortunate because of that's supposed to be something that brings people together. So a way to break out of this habit is to actively gather information and viewpoints that differ from your own um, and allow yourself to gain greater flexibility. Um, understanding that you may disagree with these viewpoints and perspectives, however, it allows you to remain more in the present and uh, with practice, it will we'll help you get down the path to correcting this thinking here. So, stress management. I know for myself, stress is something that I, I sort of rely on and I flourish on. So I've conditioned myself to put myself in stressful situations just so that I can tap into certain areas of my brain that function uh, more acutely when under stress. Now that's not the same for everyone, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about stress management and how stress management can be something that with practice you can actually get really good at um, or become really proficient with. So stress isn't a bad thing. Uh, I think we're taught that stress is a really bad thing because it sounds bad and it can you know, make things over time really become challenging um, for you to see uh, the good in situations if you're constantly stressed out or burnt out. Um, but what we have to look at is management of this stress makes it more tolerable. Um, through the holidays, there's an awful lot of stress. This year, it was a different kind of stressor for a lot of people where they weren't able to travel to see their families. 
um, and they weren't able to participate in the regular activities that they would have had, Christmas parties, um, traveling, uh, get-togethers for church, things of that nature that really didn't occur as, as frequently because of our uh, pandemic and the, the current situation that uh, people are in. Uh, one of the things we have to look at is when we're stressed differently, it evokes different memories because our brain likes to be validated. So if we have a memory of being alone during the holidays, that's going to make us feel more alone. And we're going to validate that feeling of, of uh, isolation with memories of being alone, and we're going to become more sad. Sadness is a symptom of, a dep or of, de of major depressive disorder, and understanding that when that occurs, there's ways that you can manage that stress to help kind of pull yourself out of that situation. Stress is a motivator that encourages us to put effort towards solving problems uh, that present themselves in our lives. Through reframing the way we interpret our thoughts uh, to see stress as a motivator uh, in an emotion that can be used as a tool does wonders to our ability to decrease the negative attributes of stress. There's a reason why stress management is a term. It applies to how our body and brain are naturally designed to adapt to stress and not to eliminate it as, as a helpful function in our life. Um, I know for me, stress is helpful when I need to really get something done. Um, if I need to uh, do my laundry, I might wait for a while to do it so that I make sure that I get it all done and put it away, uh, which doesn't always happen. <laughs> um, but stress is also something that can drive us to um, set, you know, set uh, New Year's resolutions, which is something that we'll talk about. Um, New Year's resolutions are, are goals that we set abruptly uh, at the first of the year because it's a new year, new me. And I always tell folks when they say they're going to set a New Year's resolution, I ask them on whatever date that is, maybe it's December 19th, I'm like, why isn't it a December 19th resolution? Why do you have to wait until the first of the year? And to really kind of reframe how people often use stress as a motivator for change. Um, developing healthy communication towards our problems help, even if we cannot find a solution for them. The more we resist talking about our problems and stressors, the more we bottle them up, which also doesn't resolve our issues, uh, but instead increases the release of negative hormones in our brain and body. Talking about your stressors, on the other hand, helps alleviate uh, the negative symptoms by releasing helpful hormones that helps us feel better. If you've ever heard of the, t the term relief, there's a reason why relief feels good. It's because it's releasing positive chemicals into the body and in the brain that makes you feel relieved. So it's one of those things to kind of keep in mind if we're looking for things in our life like relief, we have to give ourselves an opportunity to achieve it. Um, your responsibilities are important. Prioritize them accordingly. Um, thinking about what are priorities to the holidays? Um, a lot of times people are waiting for the last minute to go Christmas shopping. Um, some places have really good deals right the week of Christmas, so we wait and wait and wait, and then all of a sudden we go and we buy way too much, and then we're stressed out by the fact that we spent too much, and now we have to save money for the rest of the year or into the next year, which puts us behind maybe a financial goal that we may have set. So making sure your responsibilities are important, um, making sure you're purchasing appropriate uh, gifts or uh, spending the appropriate amount of money, you're putting yourself in a better position to start the new year. Diversifying your priorities and hobbies is an important one. Um, again, we don't want to get pigeonholed. If we look at how we, uh, if we look at taking a multiple choice uh, test, the first rule of taking that test is to answer all the questions you know so that you can go back and answer the harder ones later. And it gives you more time to free up that space in your brain to focus and activate that test positive neural network. Having a long list of uh, laundry list of honeydews can be very stressful, even though those tasks are relatively simple. Uh, it's something that takes time, and time is a commodity. So we look at also grounding ourselves in reality, um, shifting our, our focus to our basic needs. I like to, to look at this as when we neglect our basic needs, we develop more stress, which leads to not being able to focus on the simple tasks in our lives. Taking time daily to ensure that you've completed your basic needs, like taking a shower, Having your morning cup of coffee, eating, uh, sleeping, exercising regularly allows yourself to give, uh, give yourself permission to take time on focusing on you and self-care to make yourself a priority in your life. So when it comes to building new habits, I like to look at goals. Goals uh, have outcomes, and if I can track those outcomes, something that I see is that I know that I'm progressing. I like data. Data doesn't lie. If I'm looking at the data that I'm inputting, that information is factual based upon my 
recollection of the events or the output that came from the devices that gave me the information I needed. So when I look at goals and habits, I look at them as they're not the same. Um, goals are outcomes. Um, habits are the actions you take to accomplish your goal. So when I look at goals, I think of them as a SMART, as an acronym, SMART goal. And you may have heard of this before, but it's specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-oriented. A goal that has those five characteristics is going to be a lot easier for you to stay focused on because um, it's something that fits into your life in a digestible way because you started out with being specific. You then looked at how you could apply it, you looked at the measurability of it, which again is the outcome, and then you gave yourself an opportunity to realize is it achievable and how realistic is that goal. And then you're time orientating it, you're putting a timeline on it being zero to six months or six months to a year, five years, whatever it might be. That's your, your plan to, to achieve uh, that, that goal. And I like to take baby steps. Um, one of the things with baby steps allows me to do is take it slow. Uh, there was a movie called What About Bob? It was one of my favorite movies. It has, it has Bill Murray in it. Um, and he learns how to take baby steps onto the bus and baby steps off the bus. And baby steps are very important because we have to learn how to go slow at things. We can't just sprint into things. Otherwise, we're going to miss a lot of the things we have to learn in order to function when we move that way. Um, making small changes will help us slowly adjust to our goals with a realistic perspective. Um, allowing yourself to embrace new changes uh, gives yourself a chance to um, make your environment inviting to change. Um, making changes that encourage your habits or new habits and push you away from detrimental habits. Uh, if your goal is to wake up earlier, you will need to begin to go, uh, going to bed earlier, allowing for change uh, in your schedule and will require time management as respected uh, of your bedtime habits and changes. This is a very important one because a lot of people have a lot of time off around the holidays. And I know when I have time off, don't have any responsibilities in the morning, I like to sleep in, which is okay because I give myself permission to do that. The thing about it is when I sleep in, I also throw my schedule off, which makes it then harder to get up early and makes it harder to go to bed early. So when I want to go to bed earlier, I need to start winding myself down and getting myself ready for that change, allowing to make my environment supportive of it. I like to also reach out in my environment um, because I like to hold myself accountable um, and sometimes I'm not great at doing that so having friends and family there to do that will help me um, become more accountable in uh, recognizing uh, you know, what I need to be doing. Um, if I'm starting a new goal, I let others know. Uh, if I'm going to start and say I'm going to do a half marathon and I want to have a half marathon completed by uh, six months. I have to look, is that a realistic expectation? Or is it gonna be nine months? So I start to plan my event that far out. Um, if I look at something like, I wanna learn a new language, well, I think, how long will it take me to learn a new language? Um, sometimes learning the language of emotions is a new language. So zero to six months is a pretty good timeline for that because you have to learn how to say it, speak it, and use it fluently. And if uh, emotions are not part of your fluent language, it takes a little bit of time to incorporate them because it is a little strange at first. And practice takes time, change takes time, perseverance is extremely important. One of the things I understand about perseverance is that um, it's something that I have to make sure that uh, I'm willing to go the extra mile um, because then it means that I'm willing to take on the challenges that happen uh, along the way. Um, another thing about accountability is being honest with yourself and others, assertive communication, being able to hear others when they have things to tell you that maybe you don't wanna hear and being able to communicate back to them uh, using I feel language or using an opportunity for growth with that relationship. But assertive communication is I'm, I hear you, but uh, I'm also being heard, essentially. Um, keeping a log, tracking your progress, or like I said, accurate data doesn't lie. Um, keeping logs is a really good way of, of keeping yourself on track. Um, I know if I'm trying to lose weight or trying to, to hit a certain uh, exercise or fitness goal, keeping a log helps me understand where I'm at because some days when you wake up and you don't want to go to the gym early or you get out of work and you want to sit down and don't want to go to the gym, uh, keeping your log kind of keeps you in place uh, with where you're at so that you can meet that goal um, and, and motivate yourself to go to the gym. Um, and then celebrate. You've earned your accomplishments uh, from your hard work. You know, be good to yourself. You made it through the holidays. You made it through 2020. It's a tremendous thing to celebrate. Um, we're all here and, and supportive of one another um, but it's one of those things to kind of keep in mind that um, you know, through hard work, dedication, perseverance, 
all of the lumps that we've all had this year and that we've had to kind of take, um, we've made it to the end. And you're just turning over into a new page. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amber Shire, and I'm a therapist for Cedar Mountain Center, so I'm a provisionally clinical, clinically licensed social worker. Today, I'm going to go over <clears throat> just the four A's of stress management and some things that you can do daily to help with stress or to also help with depression. So the four A's, the first one is to avoid unnecessary stress. So it's okay to say no. It's okay to tell somebody if you're feeling overwhelmed that you can't help them that day or you can't do that project. Avoid people who stress you out, and then also avoiding hot button topics. So Mr. Spinney had talked about politics and about, of course, COVID that's happened this whole year. And so if talking about politics or about COVID stresses you out, avoid that, that topic. Um, the second A is alter the situation. So expressing feelings instead of bottling them up. It can be important to be able to use those I statements that he just talked about and saying, um, I feel this is always helpful instead of bottling them up to where it becomes a situation where you become so stressed out that it becomes an explosion of feelings and it becomes then becomes aggressive. Uh, be willing to compromise. So be willing to compromise with um, your loved ones or the people that you work with on different situations being more assertive, using those I statements, and managing your time better. If you have a huge to-do list, is to look at that to-do list and prioritize those tasks, and then set a schedule. Uh, a number four, or number three, is adapt to the stressor. So reframing problems. Um, so if I got a, a low score in an evaluation or on a test, is to look at it more as an opportunity to learn from that versus looking at it as a, as a failure. Look at the big picture. So if you're in a stressful situation, let's take COVID as an example, is it's not permanent. It's not something that's gonna last forever. Eventually it will, we will go, it will go away and we will go back to normal routine and not have to wear masks, masks every day um, <clears throat> and to have to keep distance from our loved ones. Adjust your standards. So perfectionism is a major source of avoidable stress. So looking at your own standards of if you put too much on your plate and that you have to have things so perfect that it's causing so much stress in your life to be able to adjust that standard and to also focus on the, focus on the positive. Uh, a number four is accept the things that you can't change. So don't try to control the uncontrollable. One thing that I uh, teach my clients is the control circle is to make a list of things that you're stressed out about and then take the things that you are able to control and work on <clears throat> and put those in the circle and then focus on that control circle and not focus on the whole list. Look for the upside and then of course, like I said before, share feelings and then also look at learning to forgive. That can be a huge thing in stress management is looking at what things that you can forgive in your life for yourself and for others. Some daily self-care tips that I have for you would be to, um, you know, look at essential oils. If you haven't, if you've never used those before, or if you do use those, looking at those as a, as a way to help with stress. Uh, some daily guided meditation. There's some great ones on YouTube. There's ones that guide you through a meditation. And there's also ones that just have music that allow you to uh, just focus on your breathing and be in the moment. Those are great to do every day. Uh, on our unit, we have people do those twice. We have our clients do those twice a day for 20 minutes. Daily journaling can be also be a great stress reliever. Reliever is to write down, you know, your feelings and emotions and the things that you're going th through throughout that day. <clears throat> it's also writing down the things that you're grateful for in the morning and at night and the things, some of the things that you got from that day that were helpful for you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then we're gonna have Kira come up also and talk and she's from our Behavioral Health Unit. Okay, hey, 
Thank you, Amber. Um, so Amber and Josh mentioned some seasonal depression and ways to manage stress. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about TMS, which stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And um, this is really for treatment resistant depression. So whether it is seasonal or it is ongoing throughout the year, um, if you have four or more failed medications and have had lack of response to therapy, TMS may be an option for you. So the first uh, step that you would take is to see a provider in our clinic. Um, they would evaluate your need um, and qualifications for TMS. And then from there, they send me the referral. Um, and I kind of get things going. The, the process to get started usually takes about one to two weeks. And then our schedule is four to six weeks out. Um, but TMS has had wonderful results. Um, we've seen about 75% of patients have, um, I guess, alleviation from symptoms, and then 51% have had complete remission um, from their depression. Um, so TMS also was FDA approved by Brains, for Brainsway in 2013, and it can treat OCD, um, and that was FDA approved in 2018. Um, keep in mind, these are patients who have been medication and treatment resistant for many, many years, and so they're finally seeing results. Um, some other disorders showing results from the clinical trials that are not yet FDA approved include smoking cessation, Alzheimer's, autism, bipolar, MS, Parkinson's, post-stroke rehabilitation, PTSD, and schizophrenia. Um, all of which have received the European CE mark um, as a sign of the, this machine's proven ability to alleviate symptoms. Um, so if you feel that you may be a candidate or may benefit from TMS and you'd like to give it a try, please give our behavioral health clinic a call and see if we can get you started. And if anyone has any questions, please write them in now. Did you say what TMS stands for? Mm -hmm. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. So it's electromagnetic um, pulses that stimulate your brain cells. And why do you have to wait for treatment if after four failed medications? Why isn't it just one medication or two? Or So due to the, the way that it was approved through the FDA um, and the way that insurance now covers it, um, so kind of a combination, TMS has proven to be a treatment resistant um, result, I guess, for those. It's, it's not that it wouldn't bring results if you aren't treatment resistant. It's kind of a last resort for a lot of people. Do you have any harmful effects if you have TMS? Um, some side effects may be headache, um, which typically will go away after the first week or two of treatments. Um, and um, there's a very small risk of seizures, but um, throughout all the clinical trials, that only came with um, heavy alcohol um, consumption with the treatments. And if someone thinks that this could be a solution for them, how do they get in touch with you or us? Um, they can call the Behavioral Health Clinic and set an appointment with a provider to be evaluated. Um, the phone number is 307-578-2283. Close this out. Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for joining us. And uh, if, if you have any more questions after watching this on uh, different platforms, uh, please know that you can reach out to us uh, at Cody Regional Health. Uh, 
Behavioral Health Clinic and Career Regional Health Cedar Mountain Center. Um, and one of the things we'd like to remind everybody is uh, taking care of yourself, taking uh, time in your, in your life, caring for your needs to help you care for the needs of others.